my Valentine stalker. So this is a story of mine from high school. When I was like 12, a new neighbor moved in with her two sons. To avoid using real names, I'll call them Peter and Paul. Peter was a little developmentally challenged and generally awkward, but I had a little crush on him and we hung out a lot. His brother, who was a year behind me, was quiet and sort of odd. He just had serial killer vibes, even at 11. So the years go by, Peter and I stop hanging out because we got older and hung out with other people, you know the drill, but Paul just sort of lingered. We all went to the same high school about 15 minutes outside of the neighborhood. He would just be everywhere I was. I was at my locker, he was around the corner looking. I was eating lunch outside with my friends, and he was a table over looking. He was in the stairwell every time I changed classes. I swear he had my schedule memorized. So in my senior year, I finally got used to it. He seemed harmless, and I was fine with just letting him be for a few more months. Plus, as every girl knows, rejecting guys can be dangerous. Yeah, he's harmless now, but Paul was a big dude. He could have beat me to a pulp if he really wanted. Just because he was the silent, creepy type didn't meant he couldn't go full Cujo. I resolved to leave him be and let him stalk away. I think he noticed I stopped caring, and for some reason, that made him ramp it up. I started getting texts from an unknown number. It started with simple hellos. Then it moved to photos of various body parts. An arm, a hand, a calf, then a full-on pick of. Well, you know. Then it moved to photos of my house at night. Progressively, they got worse until I had a picture of myself, sitting on my bed, shot from my bedroom window. At this point, I wanted to call the police, but I felt so bad. His mom is a really nice lady, and like I said, I used to have a thing for his brother. What kind of asshole am I if I reported him to the cops? He'd never get into college, never get a girlfriend, not that he should honestly, and a bunch of other stuff you probably can't get if you've been convinced of stalking and sending inappropriate pics. So I kept letting it slide. Huge mistake. It was a Sunday morning, so no school, and I slept in late. My mom was at church, and my dad got dragged along with her, so I had the house to myself. The doorbell rang, I got up. Pissed off as one would be when the doorbell wakes them up at 9 a.m. on a Sunday, and there's an envelope on my doorstep. Obviously, the mailman isn't coming on Sunday, and he's not dropping letters on my front porch with no address or stamp either. I felt super uncomfortable, and I felt like I was being watched. I grabbed the envelope, shut the door, and locked it. Then I went around and checked and locked all the other doors and windows. Inside was a rambling manifesto-style love letter in full-on serial killer handwriting with a chunk of his hair inside. It still had the roots, he seriously ripped a chunk out to send to me. At this point I was losing my shit. This was creepy turned up to 11. I went over to his house and explained the situation to his mom, who of course was horrified and apologized. I felt bad snitching, but at this point it was unhealthy for him and really scary for me. I went back home and felt a lot better having just womaned up and dealt with it. So, then Valentine's Day rolls around. This is when shit hit the fan. I woke up at around 2 a.m. on February 14th. I usually sleep through the night really well, but somebody was touching me. It was Paul, standing over me with a pair of scissors, cutting my hair. I froze in fear for a solid 30 seconds before we made eye contact. I didn't even scream, I was just petrified. And what does he do? He smiled. Not like a regular smile, I swear to God his entire face stretched. It was the scariest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. He snipped off the chunk of hair he was holding and just walked out of my room into the hallway. At that point I started screaming at the top of my lungs for my dad. He ran in, obviously freaked out and went for his gun and my mom ran in to see what happened. The police went to talk to him the next day, and he ended up being let off with a warning, which is pretty bold if you ask me. He literally broke into my house and cut my hair while I slept. What's even worse is I got the feeling he'd been in my room when I didn't know before. I'd been finding Snickers wrappers in the back of my closet for months. I hate Snickers. I just figured it was one of my friends being a slob. 
His family moved a few weeks later. His poor mom was so embarrassed she couldn't even talk to my family. I feel bad for her, it wasn't her fault. I think he was just wired a little wrong. But yeah, that's the story of my Valentine stalker. Remember to lock your doors and windows tonight. The Instagram Stalker About a year ago, I was quite the Instagram guru. I had many followers. Most of them were people I knew at school, and the rest were fake follower bots that scam you. I had thousands of followers, and all my classmates were jealous, always asking how and why I had so many. My account was not private as I often did those like for like and follow for follow things with strangers. I didn't care about internet safety at all. When school classes showed PowerPoints and videos about internet predators and stalkers, I didn't care at all. I just cared about being insta popular. I thought nobody would care about my life. I was just a normal teen living a normal teen life. Every day was the same. I would attend school, come home, and go straight up to my room to listen to boy bands and scroll through social media. Normal, right? But one day my normal life changed. It changed a lot. Call me dramatic, but this still creeps me out to this day, even though it has been almost a year now. I would post on my Instagram almost every day. I got a few hundred likes and about 5100 comments on each post. I would always like all the comments I received as I felt like I should give my Insta fans some love. One morning when I woke up, I saw that an Instagram profile called dracadany 94 had liked all of my posts. I didn't find it weird because, like I said, I would always do those like for like things. I was about to go and like his post back, but when I got onto his profile, his account was empty. I thought this was quite strange, but moved on, not knowing that this was about to get even stranger. A few days later, Dracadany94 started to leave comments on my posts. Most of my comments were things like stunning, you're so pretty hot, and even love heart emojis, but Danny's comments were by far the weirdest. I had posted a selfie caption Damon chose as my friend Damon had picked out my post. It was a trend people were doing on Snapchat, and I just wanted to follow it. Dracadanny94 commented, I hope Damon isn't your boyfriend. That would be a real shame, hot stuff. I thought that was pretty weird, coming from someone I had never met before. He had no mutual followers either. I simply ignored this comment. I thought that if I was Instagram famous, I would have a lot of people who thought I was hot. You may be thinking, is that it? That is not scary or creepy at all, but trust me when I say that we are just getting started. After a few days, I posted another photo. This time it was a group photo of about seven friends. Some of them were boys, and one of them was standing next to me in the photo. I got comments saying, great night, i.e. good party, but the one from Dracadany94 said, who is that boy standing next to you? I hope he is not your boyfriend. He isn't even as hot as me. The comments spread around the group chat, and all my friends were asking who it was. When I told them that I didn't know, they all told me to message him or reply to the comment. At first, I thought it was a stupid idea, but eventually, I did reply. My reply said, Why would you care, stranger? After half an hour, Dracadany94 didn't leave a comment. He left a DM this time. The DM read, Him. We don't have to be strangers, Emma. I got annoyed. I didn't mess with F-boys. I didn't want to play any games with anyone. Me. No, really, who are you? I do not know you. I got a fast response. Him. You don't know me, but I know you more than you think. I didn't know what he meant. What the F did that mean? I just responded with, me. Oh yeah, well, I'm not too sure about that. Good night. I wanted this conversation to end. I had better things to do than talk to this Danny guy, but he didn't give up. Him. Come on, Emma. It is only 10 p.m. Don't be boring. We went back and forth. Me. Boring? Ha, barely. I just want to sleep, that's all. Tim. Well, at times you do seem pretty wild. Me? What? Him? Well, 
Judging from your Instagram, you seem pretty wild. Partying on a Thursday. School must have been pretty shit. Were you not tired? Me. I told you I was not boring. Tim. I should have guessed. After that, I let the conversation rest. This Danny person was boring me, but he did not stop. Tim. So Emma, you like parties, huh? Well, so do I. Hello? Emma, come on, don't give me the cold shoulder yet. We have just gotten started. Me. Started on what exactly? Tim. You know chatting. I want to get to know you, M. Can I call you M? M is a cool nickname, don't you think? Me. I don't have time for chit-chat. I need sleep. Good night. I was done with this. He seemed a bit off. I just wanted to slowly slither out of the conversation. I walked over to my bed and started to get comfy. I decided I wanted to watch some YouTube before I drifted off to sleep. After a few minutes of scrolling through trashy videos of YouTubers that are getting paid way too much, I got a reply from Danny. Tim. Come on, Emma. We both know you are not sleeping. You're just on your phone. I hate liars. What? Holy shit. How did he know? Me. What? Who the F are you? I looked around to see if anyone was there. I peeked out my window, but nothing was there. I tried to calm down. Maybe he just guessed, right? Tim. Emma, chill out. You will wake up your father. Shit. This time I really freaked out. I looked out of my window again, this time scanning outside in detail. Would he come for me? Would he hurt me? I dialed 999. I put the phone to my ear. I needed to tell the police. Who knows what Danny could do? He could be watching me, stalking me, watching my every move. Before the operator could speak, I received another text from Danny. Him. I wouldn't do that if I were you. I hung up. Good girl. Me. What do you want? I felt like I was in a movie. It was like I was in Scream, but a much more updated version. Him. To be friends. Me. Bullshit. Him. Shut up. I really like you, Emma. Let me in. This was silly now. I really did feel like one of those dumb blondes in those scary films. The hot ones that were useless, the ones that ended up dead. I made sure my window was locked. I closed the curtains. Tim. Emma opened the curtains. Now I knew for sure that this was not a joke. He really was watching me. I walked down the stairs and saw my dad asleep in the living room. I didn't know if I should have woken him up or not. He probably wouldn't believe me if I told him what was going on. I stood clueless for a moment. Him. Emma, don't do anything stupid. Emma, I am warning you. Me. Oh yeah. I ignored his bullshit. I walked to the kitchen and grabbed a frying pan. Yep, I had watched the film Tangled many times. I needed something just in case. Who knows what this creep could be capable of. Tim. Why don't you let me in? We can have a drink or two. Come on, Emma. I don't know much about you. I went to dial 999 again. This time, I got through to the operator. Operator. 999, what's your emergency? Me. Okay, this is hard to explain, but I think a creep is hanging around my house. He is talking to me via Instagram and he knows details that not even my friends would know right now. Operator. Okay, honey, what's your address? We will send some officers to check it out. I told the operator my address. I realized that this whole Instagram famous thing was so stupid. Operator. Stay with us on the phone, hun. We need to make sure everything is okay. Me? Okay. Operator. The police should not be long, darling. Are you home alone, or have you got parents or carers? Me. My dad is here. My mom is. I heard a tap on the window behind me. Operator. Hello. I stayed silent. I was actually scared shitless. Why does this not happen to anybody else? The tapping was continuous. Operator. Hello. Me. 
Yes, give me a minute, for Christ's sake. I held on to the frying pan tightly. I sprinted to the other room. I hid under the dining room table. Ding! Another notification. I checked it out. Another Instagram message. Him. What is wrong with you? I was kind to you. You piece of shit. You slutty teens are all the same. Operator, are you still with us? Me. Yes, I am just getting messages from him. Jesus Christ, he is annoying. A few minutes later, the police arrived. They didn't find Danny. All they found was a knife and a telescope outside my bedroom window. They think he ran away when he saw the cars pull up. The Instagram account has been deleted, and the police say they cannot trace it for some reason, which is shit. The police were basically hopeless. They also cannot trace any sort of fingerprints or any other evidence from the items and clues found. Good thing I took screenshots of the chat, or the police would think I was crazy. So, this has a predictable ending. I keep my account private now and barely post much anymore. Who knows what could have happened? I could have ended up dead. Luckily, I didn't. Luckily, I have not heard from Danny since. Let's hope it stays that way. My experience with a stalker. When I was 19, I worked at my local guitar center and I gave lessons to kids in my free time. One afternoon, a man in his late fifties came up to me and asked if I could give lessons to his 12-year-old daughter. I said yes and eagerly gave him my email address so that he could contact me to set up a schedule for his kid. He sent emails constantly. It started off with him just saying, Hi, how are you? Several times a day and eventually led to him giving me his number. He said it would be easier to talk on the phone to set up a lesson. By then, alarms were already going off in my head. I sent him a text asking him to please leave me alone if he wasn't serious about lessons. Big mistake. Now he had my number and the calls and texts were incessant. I just want to talk, and I've been thinking about you were the messages he left me. I once again asked him to leave me alone and blocked him completely. But then he started calling me at work. My job was to check in guitars and answer phones, so he was able to reach me every single time. I always hung up when I realized it was him, but he would call back almost immediately. If I happened to be busy and someone else picked up the phone, he would ask for me directly. It was intense. I was afraid to tell my boss because it was my first job, and I was pretty much responsible for making sure the customers left feeling happy. I also thought that since I had willingly given the guy my information, that would work against me, and it would be my word vs his. I deleted the texts and emails after I blocked him, so there was no proof. Even though I obviously did not consent to being harassed, I thought it was my fault. Things got really scary one night when I ran into him in the parking lot. He approached me and told me that he was waiting for me and just wanted to talk. I got out at the same time every day, so it was easy for him to guess my schedule. Thankfully, I had called my dad before my shift ended, and he agreed to pick me up. My dad was waiting in the parking lot as well. I ran straight towards my dad's car and asked him to drive off immediately. I explained everything that had happened and my dad called the police. They couldn't do anything since the creep never directly harmed me, but I did tell my boss and the guy was banned from the store. I never saw or heard from him again, but I still think about how lucky I was from time to time. I had a stalker for 10 years. Mr. J first started stalking me when I was 13. He never approached me, he never tried to touch me or interact with me. But he was always there, in a nice bike and wearing aviator sunglasses. When dad dropped me off at school, then when I took the bus back home. When I went to the bodega two blocks away by a popsicle and before and after church. Sometimes under my window at night, his steps muffled by the distant sounds of coyotes. He never tried to break in. He never tried elaborated tricks to fetch me from school, because he was already, without a doubt, 
an adult or pretending he was a door-to-door -door salesman at my house or anything like that. He was just there, always there. The only times I ever heard him was at night. Sometimes he'd whisper, sleep well, sweet angel. And I did. For over a year, I never realized how odd it was to have an unknown man be wherever I'd go. I had learned at church that we all have guardian angels, so in my youthful mind, maybe that was mine. It was only after Paula Jean Stalker was arrested that I realized what that actually was. Paula Jean was one of those girls that seemed to be born to suffer in the kind of world that we live in. Her body was becoming adult too fast, while her mind was still childish way more than the rest of us 13 years olds. A dangerous combination. Thank goodness the worst didn't happen, but her stalker, a bald, repulsive man on his fifties, managed to grope her before someone called the police on him. As a girl who learned that her body was sinful, I think she never recovered from it. One of the teachers decided to have the talk with us girls. Pretty much, if you notice an older man following you, please let your parents or teachers know. If they follow you on the street and you're near a police station, go to it, and if not, enter a shop so you'll be a little more protected by the people inside. You're helpless if you don't surround yourself with reliable adults. It wasn't a lot, but considering it was over 20 years ago, it was almost progressive. Miss G never said it was our fault, she just said we needed to be careful, and taught us how to recognize a stalker. I think that the man in aviator sunglasses is stalking me, I told my best friend Annie, after what our teacher said. I really liked Annie, but she was one of those girls whose perception of love and passion was already ruined by cheesy books like Julia and Sabrina that she borrowed from her older sister. You know the ones. I don't think so. He's young and handsome, and he never tried to grab your breasts. Maybe you'll date him when you're older. Are you crazy? He's a stalker, I replied, getting used to the word. Now being watched by him felt wrong, dangerous even. He's kind of dreamy. Don't you think he looks a little like Ryan Phillip? I ignored Annie and told my parents about the potential threat. After that, I changed schools a lot multiple times a year. I barely bothered making friends anymore. I went to two other schools in my city, then was sent to spend the next year with my paternal grandparents. Mr. J, a nickname one of my few friends came up with still relentlessly showed up everywhere I went, even in another town, but was careful enough to not attract other people's attention. Since he was young and good-looking, and always kept his distance, the police or my relatives never took it too seriously. My problem seemed like a mere nuisance to them, so much that I almost convinced myself again that only I could see Mr. J. After living with my dad's parents for a while, I stayed with my maternal grandmother, then with a myriad of aunts from both sides. I tried to behave and never bother anyone, but it also meant that I was always uncomfortable and lonely. Look at those green eyes, he's gorgeous. You should feel lucky, an older cousin told me when I was 15, after she was sent by her mother to keep me company. I wish I could give him my number. Of course, as soon as she tried to approach him, he disappeared. I hated how people just brushed it off as something harmless or even cool just because my stalker wasn't objectively scary. I decided to go to college in another state. Still, Mr. J was always nearby. Why was he so obsessed with a common, even ugly young girl like me? Why was he always relocating his whole life to pursue me? I'd never know. Even after I turned 18, and then 21, he never came to me. He just watched from afar. We never, ever talked. His decade of stalking only ended when I was 23 and got a job opportunity in another country. Mr. J didn't follow me to Europe. For the first time in my life, I was actually free. I didn't feel followed. I didn't listen to footsteps outside my window. I didn't dread seeing that shiny red bike. I never exactly feared him. It was more like the presence of a ghost, always making you anxious, always making soft noises so you know it's there, always looming. An all-seeing eye, looking through all your vulnerabilities. From ages 23 to 29, I lived as normally as I could, and I spent my time focusing on my career, personal growth, and therapy. 
I didn't travel a lot because I feared that my stalker would come back, and I never have time to fall in love. But that was about to change. I met Tiago through work in a conference. He was from another branch, and I was tasked with showing him around. We clicked immediately. I couldn't believe that a successful man with mesmerizing emerald eyes and lovely Spanish accent could fall for me, but it was all so natural. Our love was inevitable, we were meant to be. We couldn't stand to be away from each other, even during the first few days. We were always on the phone, chatting online or together. I never felt such a connection with anyone, nor thought it would even be possible. My therapist was so proud that I finally opened up for love. Tiago and I got married exactly one year after we first met, and we lived together for seven happy years. We got ourselves a nice house, a dog and a beautiful son, and his family loved me. I never had a lot of contact with mine after I left the S, but after being so well received I barely miss them anymore. There's no doubt that those were the best years of my life, but like all good things, it was bound to end abruptly, and in the worst possible way. Two weeks ago, my beloved husband died in a motorcycle accident. I was a mess. Our time together had been so precious to me. We never fought because we were so alike, like we knew each other our whole lives. Every day with him was blissful, and with him gone, I barely had any strength to pull myself from the bed. His family helped a lot, especially with the house, the dog and the baby once my pride and joy. Now they were just shatters of the perfect life I'd never have again. As we mourned together, his mother went through old photo albums with me, her own way to keep him alive in memory. She said Tiago had always been handsome, but it became even more noticeable after his plastic surgeries. I didn't know that he had any. It was after another motorcycle accident, but he didn't like to talk about it. I guess he was 35 when it happened, so not long before meeting you. Did he change a lot? He was barely recognizable, but it couldn't be helped, since his face suffered some bone damage. She then showed me my husband in his childhood. First birthday, first tricycle, loss of first baby teeth. The pictures progressed in chronological order, and as he entered his teens, he started to show how handsome he'd be. They became sparser too. He went to study abroad when he was 15, so I don't have a lot from that time, my mother-in-law apologized. I froze when I saw two pictures of Tiago from when he was 20. I knew those sunglasses and that red bike very well. I think I met my stalker at the bar. I'm not the type of person who scares easily. I'm the friend you call when you want to go skydiving, rock climbing, or just about anything that gets your heart pumping. If you're looking for a thrill, I'm your girl. So when I found myself sitting next to a charming man at the bar who seemed to know everything about me, I wasn't exactly scared. At first, I was flattered. But that changed pretty quickly. It all started with a bad day at work. I had just been on a call with a client who was demanding beyond reason, and I was feeling pretty frazzled by the end of the day, so I knew I wanted a drink. There's a little dive bar around the corner from my house, and I love going there after work because usually, it's pretty empty, it's just me and the bartender Harry who knows me and what I drink. So, as I slid into my usual spot, I was surprised to see another person at the bar, about two stools down. He was tall, blonde, and honestly pretty good looking not my type, but I could appreciate it. Hey, how's it going, he said, turning towards me with a smile. I've been better, I replied, before ordering my drink from Harry. That bad of a day, huh? The man said, and I shrugged in response. Harry set my drink down in front of me, and I took a long sip, grateful for the numbing effect of the alcohol. So I had another. And another. Now I'm not normally the type to talk to random guys at the bar, but this guy seemed okay, so I figured what the hell. I had a shitty day with a client. I said finally, after downing my third drink. They were just being ridiculous, and I needed to blow off some steam. I know how you feel. Honestly, with some clients I wish I could just give them a little smack. The man said, laughing, and I laughed in return. You're a consultant too, I said, surprised. Yep, 
for a pretty large agency, actually. The man said, and I nodded in understanding. I'm Maya, by the way. I said, extending my hand to him. It's nice to meet you, Maya. I'm Alex. He said, shaking my hand. We chatted for about 30 minutes after that. Nothing terribly interesting. Just the most basic of small talk. He was funny, charming, and I was starting to enjoy his company. But then he said something that caught me off guard. I didn't expect to see you here. He said, which immediately struck me as weird to say. Like, what did he mean by that? What do you mean? I asked, trying to play it off like I hadn't noticed anything strange. Oh, nothing. He said, quickly waving his hand in the air dismissively. I just come here often and haven't seen a girl like you here. Now, this was my favorite bar, but I hadn't been here in weeks, so I couldn't exactly call him a liar. But I definitely hadn't seen him before, and I would have remembered a guy like him. Huh, well I come here often too, so I'm sure I would have seen you around. I said, trying to sound casual, but failing miserably. Yeah, maybe you just haven't noticed me. Alex said with a wink, and I laughed uneasily just to move past this awkward moment. After a few moments of silence, Alex broke the ice with a question I wasn't expecting. So, got any siblings? he asked, and I furrowed my brow in confusion. What an odd question to ask, I thought to myself. But I answered anyway. Yeah, I do, I said. I have a sister. Oh, I bet you've got more than just one sibling, right? he asked, and I froze for a moment. I actually had an older brother as well, but I hadn't seen him since I was a kid, and I certainly didn't talk about him. Um, no. I said finally, just the one sister. Alex nodded his head in understanding surely he couldn't have known about my brother right. There's no way. What's your sister like? You're the oldest right, he said, and I felt my heart rate start to pick up. There was no way this guy could know all of this about me. There just wasn't. How do you know I'm the oldest? I asked, trying to keep the fear out of my voice. Just a lucky guess. Alex said with a shrug, but I didn't believe him. So at this point, I was feeling like this guy was extremely weird. As we sat there, I started to look at him a little bit more closely. He was wearing a suit, but the fit was a little off, like he had borrowed it from someone. And his shoes were scuffed and old, not the expensive pair that I would expect a man in a suit to be wearing. Do you live around here? I asked him, and he nodded. Yeah, just a few blocks away, he said, before taking a sip. Really? You ever been to Jake's Coffee? I said, but he didn't know that this was a trap. There was no Jake's Coffee. Oh yeah, all the time. He said without missing a beat, and I felt my heart drop into my stomach. This guy was definitely lying. He must have seen the disbelief on my face because he quickly changed the subject. Are you single? He asked, and I felt my blood run cold. No. I lied, trying to keep my voice steady. Oh, that's a shame. He said with a wink. You know, I'm surprised someone hasn't tried to lock you down. But you know guys these days, they're always cheating and treating women like, like objects. I would never do that. As he spoke, his eye contact never wavered and I felt my skin crawl. Yeah, definitely. I said, trying to sound casual but failing again. I just recently got out of a long relationship because my boyfriend cheated on me. At this point, I felt like I needed to leave so I made up an excuse and said I had to go. Now, get this, when I said this, he actually looked kind of angry like I had just ruined his plans or something. I'll walk you out. He said, standing up from the stool and throwing some cash down on the counter. I didn't want him to walk me out, but I also didn't want to make a scene, so I just smiled and nodded. As we walked outside, he was like really, really close to me, and it was making me really uncomfortable. But I just kept walking, trying to get away from him as fast as possible. When we got to my car, he finally spoke again. It was really great meeting you, Maya. He said, and then added, I'd love to meet up with you if you're down. There's this little Italian place called Reggio's we could go. I go there every week. This guy is seriously creepy. Yeah, maybe. I said, trying to sound casual but failing again. He gave me his number and then headed off. 
I watched him for a few moments, half expecting him to turn around and watch me, but he didn't. So, what do you guys think? Should I text him? Has he been stalking me? I feel like I may be overreacting, but something about him seemed really off. I had an ex who had taken my house keys without my knowledge and had his own set of keys cut. It was terrifying. He would ring my house, telling my daughters he wanted to speak to his sweetheart. He would park directly outside my house for days on end, so when I opened the curtains, he was just there. He would message me during the night with texts starting off about how much he loved me, but they'd get worse as the night went on to the extent of him telling me he was going to put me in his car boot and torture me. I was so scared that I'd stay out of my house with my daughters until the early hours, as I didn't dare go home. At this point, I didn't know he had his own set of keys. One night, I came home around 1.30 a.m. I'd make my daughters stand near the front door while I checked every room in the house. Unbeknownst to me, he was outside watching me. He messaged saying I was lucky, as five minutes earlier he was under my bed. It scared me to death but I thought there was no way, as there were no signs of forced entry. As I said, I didn't have a clue he had gotten a set of keys to my house. He would turn up in the early hours, shouting outside my windows about how much he loved me and wanted to talk to me. The police were absolutely useless as he hadn't harmed me. One night, my sister was looking after my girls and rang me sobbing. She told me he had been at my house. I thought she meant outside shouting as he had done this the previous night. My sister was asleep in my bed at the time. We look very similar, same hair color, etc. She said no, he was in the bedroom. He was getting undressed very quietly, thinking it was me in the bed. Thank God it wasn't, as I dread to think what might have happened. The shock of him realizing it was my sister in my bed, instead of me made him grab his clothes and run. I went to the police numerous times as I now realized he had keys. They told me he wasn't doing anything wrong as he wasn't breaking and entering. I felt completely isolated in my own home, which I didn't feel safe in. I had new locks, but that didn't stop the fear. It all came to a head one night when he broke all my car windows and assaulted my daughter's father. Only then did the police intervene, and he was sent to prison. It was finally over, apart from the letters he would constantly send me, but eventually, it ended. I still see this person occasionally. I feel the same fear and have to leave wherever I am, as I do not ever want to be around that person. A lot more happened, but these are the main parts I remember. It truly was a terrifying experience, and I'm so glad your dad was waiting to pick you up. Sorry for such a long reply. It just brought everything back to me. Take care. Stalker used food deliveries to track me. I went to college in Florida. After graduating, the first thing on my mind was getting out of there, so I made plans to move across the country and start a new life. 23F at the time with all the options in the world. Everything was in order. I quit my job and a friend of mine agreed to take over my lease. I'd been living alone in a townhouse since my previous roommate graduated, so my friend moved into the other bedroom while I was preparing to move out. About a week later, 10 p.m., the two of us were watching TV when there was a knock at the door. My friend got up to answer. He came back with a bag of food from a sandwich delivery place, assuming I'd ordered it. I hadn't. We thought maybe it had been delivered to the wrong address, but there was my name and address on the receipt. The phone number on the receipt, however, was unfamiliar. I called the number and someone answered, but they never spoke. I could only hear the ambient sounds of a room and breathing. I searched the phone number and it appeared to be through an app. I convinced myself this was some kind of prank or misunderstanding. A few nights later, another knock at the door. My friend insisted on answering again, and I heard him telling a delivery person that this was a mistake. She doesn't live here anymore, no one ordered food to this address. The driver responded that they had taken the order themselves over the phone, and spoken to a man who simply asked for the specials and ordered the first one. 
It was the same number on the receipt. I called again, and again I heard someone listening on the other end. The deliveries kept coming every few nights. My move was delayed for unrelated reasons, and the longer I stayed, the more it began to really scare me. Why would someone do this? One time, I called the number after another delivery, with my friend sitting next to me. The stranger picked up the phone as usual, but this time, we heard a faint voice. She definitely still lives there. Then abrupt silence. I didn't recognize the person speaking, but I realized I shouldn't have been calling from my own number. I never called again. My friend tried, but the person on the other end never spoke aside from that one time. Eventually, most of the deliveries stopped, but someone continued harassing us for months in various ways. That phone number began calling at all hours of the day and night, sometimes 30 calls in a row. They usually called my phone, but called my friend sometimes as well. If we answered, they would immediately hang up and call again. I began getting random friend requests on every social media, with messages such as, Don't you remember meeting at the party last night? When I definitely hadn't left my house in a week. Most disturbingly, someone also started throwing eggs at the townhouse, which suggested the stalker was local and knew where I lived. Maybe he was watching every time a delivery was dropped off. Maybe he was watching other times too. The only thing I ever learned was that he knew I hadn't moved. By this point, I was staying inside as much as possible, but you have to leave the house sometimes. I was terrified until I finally moved and blocked the number. My friend elected not to take over my lease, but I was always thankful he stayed with me those last couple months. This was about eight years ago now, and I still don't have the faintest idea who it could have been. My former co-workers and a few college friends knew I was moving, but I couldn't think of anyone who would have a reason to keep track of whether or not I'd moved, and I didn't recognize their voice the one time I heard it. To this day, I refuse to answer unknown phone numbers or unexpected knocks at the door. Even contactless delivery gives me anxiety. I am always half expecting them to show up again. I dated this girl about 10 years ago when I was 21, she was 20. Serious mental case. Some highlights. Two weeks into the relationship her grandmother passed away. She got furious with me because I couldn't attend the funeral he had to work, and was told the day of the funeral that she wanted me to go. One month and she insists we celebrate our anniversary. I'm thinking whatever. Take her out to dinner. She gives me a gift of a keychain with a picture of her as a baby on it, and the inscription, I love you forever. I broke up with her shortly after that. This followed by four plus calls a day and numerous texts over the next four months. Which would go back and forth from, I hate you. To, why did you leave me? I love you. Please take me back. She had NSYNC and Backstreet Boys dolls all over her room. She had told me she wasn't a virgin when we met. Turns out she lied about that, and I was her first. Found that out from an old friend of hers. I eventually had to change my email, phone number just to get her off my case. I still get the occasional friend request from her on Facebook. I'm going to swallow my pride and admit that my craziest stalker story is about me acting like a raging bag of nuts as F. I was 21 and realized at the end of my first serious relationship albeit. It was long distance, but it had lasted two years and I had dumbly been planning to move to the city he lived in that my then boyfriend had been cheating on me for the last year we were together with a girl he went to school with. I found out through a friend of his, got it confirmed by the girl he was cheating with, and as soon as he found out I knew he turned off his phone and wouldn't answer a single call I made. Actually, if his phone was on he'd answer it and then hang up with no greeting and sound. So, I went batch it off the deep end. Called him 50 times in a row, repeatedly. Texted him like crazy. Facebook messaged him. He responded four days later with a message about wanting to kill himself for hurting me. I freaked out and took it serious and continued messaging him. I then periodically message and call him every so often just to see if he'd respond. 
I talked to his friends. I even contacted his mother. And about nine months or so later, I came out of it and realized I had been totally messed over by a raging D-head and had also handed him all my self-respect on a silver platter. I just let my hurt turn me crazy, and it is totally the most embarrassing thing in my past. I sometimes wish I could talk to him and just say, Hey, sorry about that. You're still a D though. But then I remember I'm blocked on every social media website out there, and I let it go and focus on being as uncrazy as possible to my current boyfriend. Not a boyfriend, but still creepy as F. About a year ago, a guy asked me out. Now, this is extremely out of the ordinary for me, and I didn't know how to react. I said sure. I didn't find him attractive, but wanted to give him a chance. It turns out he was a complete jerk. The date was terrible, and he actually texted me asking for a second one. I said no. About six months after that, I got a call saying something like, Hello, Ilike Wallet. I am stalking you from around the corner. Don't move or I will shoot. I was by the window, and I thought I was going to die. It was a blocked number, and the voice was computerized. About two months ago, I found out it was him because he texted me something creepy. I still get scared sometimes, thinking someone is going to start shooting at me. After a week of dating this girl, she decided to make a collage of us. It was weird. It had pictures of me from the internet and pictures of her from the internet. It also had a drawing of us and the date that I asked her out on which was a week prior to that. There was another time that I got stalker notes put in my locker. It was weird because I had been dating a girl for like a year, and during our relationship, I got these notes that basically said, You don't know me but I know you. It was weird. They all described how this girl had been watching me, but was too shy to approach me. They also said that I would meet her sometime soon. My girlfriend wasn't happy with that, and I put a note up on my locker that rejected my stalker lol. I had an entertainment center advertise and a woman asked to come over to have a look at it. We set up a time and when the time came, she didn't show up. I texted her and a couple hours later, he replied and asked if it was too late to come by. It was 10 p.m., but I said, okay. She said she would be there in 10 minutes. But wasn't there 20 minutes later and I texted her again? 10 more minutes, she said, but she hadn't shown up by 11 p.m. So I texted again and said we would have to do it another day and she replied that she was just pulling up. I go to my front door and sure enough she is pulling into the driveway and there are about four or five other people in the car with her. They all get out and start walking towards the door and I ask them what they are doing and the woman says they all want to see the entertainment center. I tell her that only she can come in, and at that point, I wasn't sure I even wanted her to come in. She says she needs at least one other person's opinion. I say no, she gets indignant, and I ask her to leave, and she says that I am not being a very good Christian. I say I am fine with that and went in my house and locked all the doors, peeking out the window. One of the dudes who was with her is pissing at the end of my driveway, but then they get in the car and drive away. The whole thing was super bizarre. Roommate subleased his room without telling us. The three of us in the house were all around 22 years old. The guy that sub let the room was 36, unemployed, socially awkward, and pothead. Not that there is anything wrong with that. He would blare Metallica all day. He would just stay in the house only leaving at odd hours. Really sketchy. Then one day my roommate noticed his guitar was missing, and then other guitar was missing. We confronted him. After about 20 minutes of bullshit excuses, he admitted he pawned them for the power bill and he wouldn't have rent for us. We called the police so we could report the stolen guitars, since you need to have a report to get anything from a pawn shop back. It turns out he already had a warrant out for his arrest for the same shit a town over. Anyway, the cops confronted him in our house while he was frantically trying to get all his stuff packed. 
He was coming down the stairs with all his luggage when the cops asked him to step outside. Right before he went outside to talk to the cops, he said, don't take any of my shit in what I think was a joking manner. Either way, he was arrested and we put hit shit on the curb. Good times. This isn't a horror story at all, but the guy I sold a TV to a couple of years ago pretty much assumed that I was going to murder him and his boyfriend. I got the impression that he thought that I was going to scam him, so I offered to drop the TV off at his house, and he could just PayPal me the money. He didn't want me knowing where he lived, so I offered to have him pick it up after my daughter's soccer game. Wouldn't do that either because he said I'd have too many of my people. So I then switched it to the parking lot of my town's grocery store at 3.30 p.m. No. He finally agreed to meet me in front of the town's police station with his boyfriend and two other guys only after he called an officer outside to witness the transaction. The cop told the guy he probably shouldn't be buying stuff on Craigslist anymore. The funny thing was that he brought so many people that the DV wouldn't fit in his car. I was new to a big city and decided I didn't need my car anymore. I listed my car for sale, a six-year-old Honda Accord. A normal, well-dressed man comes over to see it after a few phone calls about it. He's in his early 40s and his name is James. He's buying it for his daughter in college. I always have my guard up when dealing with strangers, but so far James is personable and seems legitimate. He test drives it with me in it. He does a thorough inspection. He negotiates the price with me for a while. He asks me to hold the car for two days so he can get the money and come pick it up. I agree, a two-day hold where I won't sell it to someone else. Two days later, James follows up and we meet again. Midday, normal neighborhood in an urban city. James and I test drive the car one more time. He gives me a Chase Bank cashier's check, which I said was fine. I tell him he needs to come to the bank with me to cash this check and to get the title notarized over to him. This is when he starts acting nervous. We're pulled over on the side of my street discussing this. James in the driver's seat and me as the passenger. I figured if he was going to steal my car, he would have two days earlier. Now I'm fairly comfortable with him. He asked me to do one more car inspection with him, then we'd go to the bank. I agree, but I'm very set on doing the transaction at a bank. As we both get out to inspect the car again, he jumps back in and floors it as I try to get back in with him. He pulls away quicker than I can react, passenger door wide open. I tried to run after him and then realized I'm not as fast as a car. There are bystanders and I hysterically ask someone to call 911. One guy does. I had my phone, but my adrenaline was through the roof and didn't even think of it. As I'm on a stranger's phone with dispatch, an undercover cop car with two officers pulls out of an ally five feet from me. I wave them down and hysterically explain my story. They tell me to hop in the back of their car, which I do. I implore them to hurry and we can catch this guy he just drove off. I explain the car and plate and everything. They assure me that they will not go on a high-speed chase with me in the car, but will radio it in to all surrounding officers, which they do. The guy gets away and the officers drop me off at the police station to file the report. I file an insurance claim, too, and I'm so mad at myself for letting this happen. I suppose it's better than if I was in the car with this guy, but I'm still mad. Of course, James Burner's cell phone doesn't work as soon as he had left. I go through insurance and their protocols to ensure I'm not committing fraud for about three months. The week I'm supposed to get paid, I get a call from police. They found my car. Three states over. James was working with a partner in crime. Don't remember his name. Let's call him Dickface. James stole the car and gave it to Dickface to sell so it wasn't traceable back to James and Dickface would have plausible deniability if he was ever questioned. Well, Dickface sold my car to an average Joe who actually did have a daughter in college who needed a car. The daughter tried to register her new car at the DMV and it came up as stolen. So the cops arranged for me, the average Joe and Dickface, 
whose contact info average Joe had as he paid him with a check and there was a paper trail, to meet with him at the station for a little chat. Dickface denies any involvement with James, but agrees to give us the money back that average Joe paid him, if he can just leave without any problems. We all agree to this. Average Joe and I say his daughter can keep the car and I'll take the money from Dickface. So eventually I got paid for my car. But this experience sucked balls and was very stressful. Since then I have bought and sold cars on Craigslist again. So no lesson was learned. Except now I take a photo of the driver's license of all people I interact with at the start. was moving out of an app that had washer and dryer hookups into one that did not. So I sold my washer and dryer, ended up having separate buyers. Guy who bought the dryer was great. He was getting it for his daughter who was going to college. I helped him load it up in his truck. He gave me the payment, and I never heard from him again. The guy who bought the washer was a different story. I got a text from him, asking if it was still available. We haggled the price all normal stuff. We set a time, and I waited for him to get there. Now I only had one week left in the app, so I didn't care too much about random people coming to my home like I normally would. Pretty much all of my stuff was moved into my new place, but the internet wasn't turned on yet, so I was still just sleeping on an air mattress in the old one for the time being. He ended up being a few hours late and showed up in a truck that was used for transporting large glass panes like this. He had like five people with him all crammed onto the front bench seat of the truck. They loaded it onto the truck with it leaning at a 30 degree angle against the glass pane rack or whatever you would call it. He tried to haggle it down to a lower price but I didn't budge. He left and I thought it was done. Later that night I start getting texts from him about how it doesn't work and he wants his money back. I told him as it was written in the post that it was sold as is and was working. I assume he damaged it in the way he rigged it on his truck. Well, after a day, he starts calling me and cussing me out, texting death threats. And I have other random numbers calling me doing that same. Two nights after I sold it, I wake up at 3 a.m. with people banging on my door yelling. Luckily, I lived on the second floor with no easy access to the windows. I sat there for about 15 minutes while they continues to yell through the door. The next day I moved the rest of my stuff into my new app and never went back other than to turn the keys in. I still got call calls, texts from him on random numbers for two months over a $150 washer. I don't sell stuff on Craigslist anymore. My youngest brother sent me a text one day. He'd saved up. 700 and wanted a computer. I told him I know a uh, subreddit we can go to. But no, he's found a guy on key with a machine. Says it's like a 1,000 machine for 600 want me to go with him to check it out. I can't. Schedule is packed. Guy basically says he can do a Skype call showing the CA working and I can peek inside the guts from the video call. So I do that. It looks good. Very high-end computer and everything is brand new with boxes for the components. I tell my little bro, who is 18, that it's all good if he can snatch it. Go for it. Well, about 8 p.m., I get a Skype message from the kill seller. I got your brother. I freeze. Blood runs cold and for a solid 20 seconds that felt like hours. I started running through how I was going to find this mother F and murder him with my bare hands for threatening to hurt my baby brother. Finally, he finishes typing his second message. He wanted to meet in Walmart parking lot. We met up and I got out to shake his hand and he just fainted. He's sitting in my sous vide. He woke up once and just passed right back out. So I told my bro no because I had work. But obviously this needed to be handled. So I go out. I get out of my car and instantly see why my brother basically shit his pants. This dude steps around the SUV and is like 9 feet tall, exaggerating 7 foot and some change, and was so jacked I think he could beat up Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. 
I'm a little less paranoid than my brother, so I hold my hand out for a shake. We do so and he puts a giant hand on my shoulder and points inside the SUV. I can see my little brother sitting in the far back seat with his knees on his chest, like a puppy during a thunderstorm. I chat with the guy. He literally just tried to meet my brother to sell the computer, but he actually fainted in terror. He scooped him up and put him in the back seat to rest. It actually happened. So I open the door and pop my head in, little bro basically on the verge of tears. Explain the situation to him. He admits that he thought the Klaus seller was going to beat him up, steal his 800, and possibly touch his bum inappropriately. I laugh. The seller laughs. I chat with the guy for a bit as my brother is loading the stuff into his car. The guy said he bought computer parts yearly when they went on sale and always sold them for a profit for himself, but at a pretty low cost since he slowly built them over the year. Was actually a really great guy. Said my brother was the first person to ever pass out in fear. I mean, all's well that ends well, and I'm sure it was more scary from my brother's pov but getting a message from a guy on Skype, I have your brother, is pretty damn scary to be honest. I've posted this before, but a guy I knew from college got a houseboy from Kiel trade rent for sex kind of deal. The houseboy was apparently not too stable, and after getting in a fight over money, managed to strangle the guy I knew to death with a phone cord stole his car and was later caught a few states over. I got GTA V for the PS3, but then got a PS4 about two weeks later since I got surprised by an extra large paycheck and had money to blow. So I decided to sell my S3 copy for $40. As soon as I put the listing up, I legit got a text not even 10 minutes later for a guy that wanted to meet in half an hour to pick it up. I wasn't busy, so I decided to do it. The guy was about 10 years older than me, incredibly skinny, to the point of ribs practically showing through his shirt, and had a tick. Anyway, I make the transaction and think that's the end of it. Nope. On my drive home, texted me, wanting me to come over to his place and play it with him. I politely decline. He then goes on to text me a novel about his life story and his time serving in Afghanistan and his pets in depression. I felt bad for him, but still didn't want to go hang out with a stranger I meet on Craigslist. He then starts asking me when I'd be free to hang out and tries to make plans. I explain politely that I'm not really looking to make friends through Craigslist or anything. He tries calling me. I turn off my phone and go to sleep. I turn it back on in the morning and I've got 20 something missed calls and over 60 text messages from him getting increasingly more angry, violent, and threatening as they went along. I installed an app to block his number, and that solved it. But for a good week or two, I was afraid of accidentally running into him again. My husband made a fake account and then trolled the free dresser in that I made for almost a week. He kept asking me to smell it and describe the smell and silly things like that. By the time I figured out I was being trolled, he had asked if I could cut the dresser into more manageable pieces so it could fit onto his motorcycle. In 2012, I was trying to sell some video games on Craigslist and got plenty of normal emails inquiring about the condition of the games and stuff. Then I get an email that says, hey, and there's a goddamn dick pic attached to it. The body of the email was like, saw your ad for a jack-off partner. You like, 30 seconds later, I get another email that says, please delete. I'm sorry that was for someone else. Followed by, please, just delete it and pretend this never happened. I didn't reply to any of the emails, just blocked him immediately. My thought is he was probably browsing around on two different tabs and replied to mine on accident. Oh, Craigslist. We were selling a house on Craigslist and we started getting calls about it being for rent. 
Sure enough, there was a for rent ad picturing our house and giving a phony realtor email address. I contacted the advertiser who claimed he was the owner away doing missionary work in Africa. He wanted me to wire the deposit. I played along with some back and forth emails until he got suspicious and stopped communicating. We reported this fraud to Craigslist, who responded by blocking our email address. Now, when we use Craigslist, we have to use a different email when placing aids. I went to look at a couch in a nice residential neighborhood. The poster was a doctor at a local hospital who said she had a shift, but I could work out a time with her husband, who would be home. So I called him. She had a beautiful accent, Persian, and was clearly fluent, but English was not his strong suit. Still, we worked out a time. When I went over, he was very nice. A bit of a communication gap, but that's fine. I wish I spoke one, and a half languages, you know. The couch was actually a huge, multipiece, turquoise brocade thing. Much too big for my tiny space and too loud for my eyeballs to bear every day. Beautiful in its own way, but not for me. So I thanked him for his time, told him it was too big for my studio. And his response was to confidently reach around and squeeze my ass. It was the way he did it that was weird. It didn't even seem sexual or anything. It was like he was just testing a melon for ripeness. I looked at him like he was nuts. He looked back at me like the situation was perfectly normal. And I turned and walked out the door without a word. I no longer go to El Meets on my own. Edit. You'll have a lot of furniture for sale. Edit 2. This is my highest rated comment on Reddit. Note to self. Butt stuff worthless internet points. I've shared this before, but people seem to get a kick out of it. Not much of a horror story, but my most interesting Craigslist sale. Was selling a 70s Buick for $1,500. I had a few calls, but no one super interested. Then I had a kid, maybe 21 call, and he really wanted the car. I told him $1,500, but I was willing to talk about it. He said, okay, I'll see you at 7 p.m. at this parking lot. I get there at 6, 50, and he never shows. 7.30, I call but no answer and I go home. At 9, 45 that night, he calls me actually apologizing for not showing and asks if I can meet there now. Sure, I just want to get rid of this car leaking oil in my driveway. I get there at 10 and he still isn't there. I get ready to leave at 10. 15 and he rolls up in a Caprice Classic with giant rims on it. The driver gets out, two really skanky looking girls get out of the back and the kid buying the car gets out of the front. He opens the car, pops the hood, starts it, checks it all out. He takes it on a quick drive while I am standing with the two skanky girls and the driver. He comes back hops out of the car and waves me to the car. Kid, I really want this man. This is awesome. Me. Okay, well, I would like $1,500, but what are you wanting to pay? Kid, I was only able to scrape together $1,300, but I've got a good deal for you. Give it to me for $1,250, and you can have her pointing to the skanky brunette. Or let's do this for $1,000, and you can have them both. Me. I turn and look at the girls. My guess is they are 16 and look like they do it right here in the parking lot. Yeah, I'll just take the $1,300 and you can get the car. Kid, what? You don't think they'd be good? Yeah, man, that pussy is tight enough to rip your dick off. $1,250 and you can have the blonde. Me, no thanks though. They do look like they'd be a good F.I., but I'll have to pass. Kid, all right, man, you don't know what you're missing. I'll give you a two-day window. If you want either of them, just give me a call. You can refund $50 or $300, and we can work it out. Me, enjoy the car, and thanks for the two days. He actually gave me $1,300 in cash, and $155 of it was in ones but I did not call him back to get the girls. 
my wife would have probably frowned on that. I agreed to meet with this guy once to buy an Atari Jaguar. I'm a collector. I get to his house at the agreed time and there's no one there. I send him an email while hanging out in my car and he says he had to get groceries but will be back in a few minutes. I decide to sit on the hood of my car and wait. His neighbors walk outside and yell to me, Hey man, you waiting on Jamal for games or drugs? Oh... J just games? At this point, I kind of wanted to book it out of there, but he pulled up to the house right as I fumbled with my keys. In all, the guy was a little creepy and was a complete dick to his daughter. His wife seemed nice enough, though, got the Atari, and got the heck out of there. I saw an old Pioneer integrated amp I liked bundled with a couple other items that the guy wanted to trade for a laptop. I emailed, asking what he'd take in cash for it. He said make an offer, so I offered $100. Apparently, that insulted him, and we exchanged a few more angry emails, ending with me telling him something when you get a shit laptop with a jizz-stained keyboard. You'll wish you took my $100. To be fair... He was being a dick first. The next day, he is just the amp up for $150. Why didn't he just tell me he wanted $150? The thing is, I still wanted it, so I just made a new email and went up to meet him. I was naturally a little nervous, but he wasn't a bad guy, really. He had a lot of vintage audio equipment that he was trying to sell and was getting jerked around a lot. I love the amp, though. It was a great purchase. My parents gave away an old couch for free to a woman who lived on the fourth floor of an apartment building. She took it from them on one condition. She didn't want to carry it up the stairs, so she told my parents that she would pay them to bring it up for her. Being both a bit strapped for money and just generally nice people, they agreed. They bring up the couch while the woman watched, and when they asked for their payment, she asked them, Do you like roosters? Instead of giving them money... She handed them probably the creepiest carved wooden rooster I've ever seen. This thing looks like the abyss gazing back at you. Then, she ran back inside. The whole situation was so ridiculous that they weren't even particularly pissed and it's still in our house 13 years later. I love vintage and antique furniture. So when I moved into my first apartment, I didn't have much money, so I used Craigslist, Gumtree a lot. I found this amazing vintage wooden trunk advertised and arranged to pick it up. On the phone, the seller sounded like a normal elderly lady, but I went with a friend to help carry it into my car. Turn up at her house and, and things appear quite normal. She's in her 60s and quite middle class and appears quite respectable. She shows me the trunk and we agree on a price and then offers to show me other furniture she has for sale in another room. I agree so me and my friend walk into the room and it's crazy. It's a treasure trove of bizarre junk. There are taxidermied animals everywhere, like stuffed kittens wearing outfits in these little globes. Just general weird shit. The lady then explains that she's selling it all for a older gentleman who doesn't know how to use the internet, explains that she's been widowed for 20 years and how he is her new friend and then goes into extremely graphic detail on their sex life together. My friend and I just politely nod during her rambling and she starts to describe the orgies she has had since retirement and her preference on sex toys and asks if we would like to see them. At this point, I just kind of picked up the trunk and ran out of there. All I could think on the way home is that it must have been some sort of hidden camera prank or she really was some sort of sex, crazed older lady. I was selling a motorcycle. The guy lived a few hours away and wanted to know a lot of information. So over the course of a couple of days, we emailed back and forth. He asked for pictures of this, pictures of that details, etc. Then we spent another day negotiating a price via email. 
Finally, he made an acceptable offer, and I emailed that it was good. Then I never heard from him again. Two days went by, and I emailed asking when he wanted to come get it. His reply was, oh, I don't have that much money. Put a body kit up on CL and got contacted about a guy that lived about two hours away that wanted to come and buy it. I was working night shift at a bowling alley at the time. He called me about 6 p.m. on a Saturday night that he was almost in town to pick it up. I reminded him that we had not arranged a meeting place nor time. Also, I was at work for another eight hours and the kit was 30 minutes away at my parents'. He then began to blow up my phone, bitching that he and his friend took off of work and rented a van to come pick it up. Sorry, bud. Not my fault. The closest I have was when I was selling a 97 Corvette on CLN in 2012. It was in good shape and mechanically sound. I knew what the car was worth and had it priced fairly at 15 I start getting hits from a guy who lives about an hour away about the car, and eventually he wants to see it. So we meet halfway in a Walmart parking lot. He leaves me the keys to his Denali and takes it for a spin with his wife, still manages to do a big burnout on his way out, which whatever, that's what those cars are for. He comes back and asks if I would take 14.5k, I say sure. We plan to meet there again next week. I say I want a cashier's check and he should bring his license so we can do a bill of sale as I would be pulling the plates. Fast forward the next weekend, we meet up again. He says he wants another test drive before he pulls the trigger. I say go for it when he hands me the keys to his Denali and off he goes again. 20 minutes later, her rolls back up and says, I don't know, something feels off, can't put his finger on it. I ask what it is or could be, he says he just doesn't quite know. I ask him what he wants to do, and he offers me 12 k At that point, I laughed at him and throw him his keys and say, let me know if you change your mind as I hop back in my car. Then he stops me and says, no, I do want it. What about 13? At this point, I realize he either brought all the money or he isn't going to buy it. So I say, the 14.5 we agreed on or deals off. He pulls out a cashier's check for 12 k and then gives me the other 2500 in cash. So he had planned such an attack. Oh well, turned out fine for me. It just bothers me people are always up for trying to weasel you out of money. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.